This is the 14th lecture in the course, The State of the United States Economy and Society. We are said to be a nation ruled by law rather than by the directives of individuals holding positions of authority. For differing reasons, many of us argue that our system of laws violates fundamental human rights or the laws are inconsistently enforced. The erosion of respect for the law and for those charged with enforcement of law has exposed serious cracks in the American system. Violent crimes against us as individuals are the type of crimes that make the evening news. Families are often devastated by these acts, and as a society there is no disagreement that penalties need to be strong. FBI data released in September of 2018 indicated that violent crime fell in 2017 and again in 2018. It is noteworthy that about 73% of murders are committed with guns, a proportion that has been increasing yearly. Aggravated assault is the most common type of violent crime committed in the United States, followed by robbery. Homicide accounted for about five cases out of 100,000. The state with the lowest violent crime is Maine. Alaskans experience the highest rate of violent crime every year. Proponents of gun ownership or of gun control can argue over the impact guns have on violent crimes. What economists know is that the sale of guns, other weapons, and ammunition has become an important part of the security-focused economy. Surveys indicate that the percent of individuals who own guns has been falling and is probably somewhere between 38 and 46 percent. Guns are good for GDP, not so good for building social cohesion. Three of every 100,000 Americans are killed by guns each year. Around 16,000 people require medical attention annually from gun-related injuries. Every year, around 21,000 people, one half of the total, commit suicide using a firearm. This chart seems to confirm what gun ownership proponents suggest, that the expanded private ownership of firearms results in a significant reduction in the use of firearms resulting in a homicide. However, before one reaches that conclusion, more detail is needed. For example, surveys of Texans indicate that 44% of gun owners own two to five guns. One in five Texan gun owners own more than five guns. What other factors might contribute to the declining gun homicides? Aging of the population is one to consider. A widespread perception is that black and Latino men are the most frequent perpetrators of violent crime in the United States. The U.S. Department of Justice statistics indicate that about 2 in 100 black men actually commit a violent crime in any given year. Among the urban poor, black-on-black -black assaults occur at a rate of 51 per 1,000, while white-on-white -white assaults occur at the rate of 56 per 1,000. A 2016 report of crime and race by Edwin Rubenstein of the New Century Foundation analyzed police reports and surveyed victims and witnesses, concluding, There are dramatic race differences in crime rates. Asians have the lowest rates, followed by whites and then Hispanics. Blacks have notably high crime rates. This pattern holds true for virtually all crime categories and for virtually all age groups. In 2015, a black person was 2.45 times more likely than a white person to be shot and killed by the police. An Hispanic person was 1.21 times more likely. These figures are well within what would be expected given race differences in crime rates and likelihood to resist arrest. In 2013, of the approximately 660,000 crimes of interracial violence that involved blacks and whites, blacks were the perpetrators 85% of the time. This meant a black person was 27 times more likely to attack a white person than vice versa. An Hispanic was eight times more likely to attack a white person than vice versa. 
Property crimes such as burglary and motor vehicle theft also appear to be in long-term decline, falling from an estimated 35.1 million cases in 1993 to 16.8 million in 2013. An analysis of 2017 crime statistics by the New York University Law School confirmed that the downward trend was continuing. There is also the fact that many crimes are not reported to the police. Only one third of property crimes are reported. Most do not result in the arrest, charging, and prosecution of a suspect. An encouraging sign is the decline in the number of youths arrested as well as those eventually confined in correctional facilities. More young persons found guilty of committing a crime are now confined separately from adults. However, there is a significant disparity based on race and skin color. Black youth are 8.6 times more likely to receive an adult prison sentence for similar criminal offenses. The use and abuse of addictive chemical substances ruins many lives. We have spent billions of dollars and incarcerated millions of people for producing, distributing, and consuming these chemicals. These measures have accomplished little except to enrich drug cartels whose members rely on violence to conduct their activities. Nor have educational efforts been effective. On the one hand, there are millions of existing and potential users of drugs who succumb to their use. And on the supply side, there are the enormous profits to be made by people who control the supply and distribution. A 1999 investigation by the PBS program Frontline concluded as follows. Globalization hit organized crime over the last decade and now is integral to its most profitable business, the international narcotics traffic. Once a regional problem involving a customer base of a few million and barely a billion dollars in sales, the illegal drug industry is now a worldwide enterprise with tens of millions of hardcore consumers spending hundreds of billions on opiates, cocaine, amphetamines, and marijuana, as well as other drugs. Fast forward to 2019, and the problems of addiction affect every community and almost every family. A 2014 report generated by the RAND Corporation for the U.S. White House Office of National Drug Control Policy adds this. Drug users in the United States spend on the order of $100 billion annually on all four drugs in 2010 dollars. This figure has been stable over the decade, but there have been important shifts in the drugs being purchased. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that opioids, including prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl, killed more than 42,000 people in 2016 out of a total of 63,600 deaths caused by drug overdose. Some 40% of all overdose deaths involved a prescription opioid. After far too long, physicians have finally awakened to the addictions they fostered by prescribing opioids to deal with patient pain. The rate of deaths involving opioids increased from 2.9 per 100,000 in 1999 to 10.4 per 100,000 in 2015. From 2015 to 2016, deaths from fentanyl and other synthetic opiates more than doubled deaths from heroin increased nearly 20 percent and deaths from other opioids such as hydrocodone and oxycodone increased 14 percent additionally a march 2018 cdc report showed a 30 percent increase in emergency department opioid overdose visits from july to september 2016 versus july to september 2017. Nationwide, overdose deaths from methamphetamine and similar drugs rose by 7.5 times between 2007 and 2017. In combination, all drug overdoses are now the leading cause of death among Americans under age 50. 
The issue for us as a society is how to respond to the widespread use of life-destroying drugs. While we have allowed the large pharmaceutical companies to manufacture strong, addicting opioids and allowed medical practitioners to prescribe them to patients with almost no oversight, we have convicted and incarcerated an estimated 2.3 million people for possession and or distribution of narcotics and other illegal substances. This graph shows the results of an opinion survey conducted in May of 2017. After taking office, the now former Attorney General Jeff Sessions remained convinced that the criminal justice system and long prison sentences are the appropriate societal response. One former federal prosecutor, David Sklansky, responded. It can't be emphasized enough that the direction they're pointing is 180 degrees wrong. Mandatory minimums have had a terrible effect on the American criminal justice system, and we need to retreat further from their use, not return to the patterns of usage a decade ago. Billions of dollars are lost every year as a result of computer and network intrusions, cyber attacks by criminals for adversaries and terrorists. Law enforcement has had to respond by continuous expansion of resources and staff. The Federal Bureau of Investigation Cyber Division employs specially trained cyber squads located at the FBI headquarters and in each of its 56 field offices. One category of cybercrime that is seemingly uncontrollable is identity theft. The 2018 study by Javelin Strategy and Research found that some 16.7 million people were victimized by identity fraud, an increase of 8% over 2017. An estimated $16.8 billion was stolen from consumers. In 2018, the Federal Trade Commission processed 1.4 million fraud reports totaling $1.48 billion in losses. Credit card fraud was most prevalent in identity theft cases. More than 167,000 people reported a fraudulent credit card account was opened with their information. As this chart indicates, the greatest losses are experienced by people aged 70 and older. The sad state of affairs is that we are victimized by a wide and growing range of identity theft and internet-based crimes. One has to question the ethical basis of our relations with one another and why such a large number of people are drawn to this behavior. In part, it comes down to what the American political economist Henry George observed about us late in the 19th century. George wrote, this disposition of men to seek the satisfaction of their desires with the minimum exertion is so universal and unfailing that it constitutes one of those invariable sequences that we denominate laws of nature and which we may safely reason. This 2015 survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers of 500 U.S. executives security experts and others reported heightened concerns over cybersecurity and the potential for cyber attacks. The report concluded, globally, a record 1 billion data records were compromised in 2014. As motives and means continue to evolve, so do the methods of attack. Distributed denial of service attacks are being increasingly potent and are one of the most frequent types of cybersecurity incidents. Gamalto, a major leader in digital security, found 918 data breaches compromising 1.9 billion data records around the world occurred during the first six months of 2017. This represented a 164% increase from 2016. In May, a ransomware virus affected 200,000 victims in 150 countries. And then there was the Equifax revelation that information on 143 million Americans was compromised in 2017. 
A 2018 cost of a data breach study by Ponemon Institute found that the global average cost of a data breach was up 6.4% over 2017 to $3.86 million. The average cost for each lost or stolen record containing sensitive and confidential information also increased by 4.8% year over year to $148. Experts in cybercrime forecast that the damage will cost $6 trillion annually by 2021, doubling the cost incurred in 2015. In response, spending on cybersecurity rose to $86.4 billion in 2017, $114 billion in 2018. Statista reports the U.S. spent $66 billion on cybersecurity in 2018, up from $54.8 billion in 2016. Decisions are regularly made by top executives of corporations and other businesses to circumvent or directly violate existing laws and regulations in their quest for profits and personal financial gain. In this sense, the actions of some business leaders result in public harm as or more devastating than the activities of what we think of as organized criminal enterprises. The organization Havoc Scope gathers the statistics on a long list of illegal or black market commerce. Here is a list of the dollar volume of some of these activities. These figures reveal the extent to which people are engaged in illegal activities, many of which violate fundamental human rights and are environmentally destructive. The list of serious corporate crimes identified and prosecuted continues to grow. British Petroleum paid $20 billion in 2015 to settle civil charges relating to the Deepwater Horizon disaster. $4 billion paid in criminal penalties. Volkswagen was penalized $2.8 billion for purposely building a diesel engine equipped with software to misreport greenhouse gas emissions. U.S. banks were fined $200 billion for their role in the financial crisis. The world's financial institutions were found guilty of predatory lending fraud in the creation and marketing of various asset-backed securities and derivatives. Bank of America got into trouble for the practice of robo-signing in connection with foreclosure actions and for predatory practices under the government's Home Affordable Modification Program, as described by journalist David Dayen in 2013. The government's Home Affordable Modification Program which gave banks cash incentives to modify loans under certain standards, was supposed to streamline the process and help up to 4 million struggling homeowners. In reality, Bank of America used it as a tool to squeeze as much money as possible out of struggling borrowers before eventually foreclosing on them. Bank executives and managers have hardly blinked. Multiple banks implicated in the scheme agreed in 2015 to pay $4.3 billion in fines for their roles in manipulating foreign exchange markets. The banks included HSBC, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Royal Bank of Scotland, and UBS. Fraud as an accepted business practice exacerbated the depth and duration of the latest and all other collapses in our financial markets. And yet, as one law professor commented back in February of 2015, after Standard & Poor's agreed to pay $1.375 billion to settle civil charges that it inflated ratings on private label mortgage-backed securities, more often than not, when the largest corporations are prosecuted federally, individuals aren't charged. Somewhat surprisingly, during 2017, Texas Republican member of the U.S. House of Representatives, Jeb Henserling, who introduced legislation to scale back portions of the Dodd-Frank bill, 
came down fairly hard on Wells Fargo and Company Chief Executive John Stumpf, testifying before the House Financial Services Committee. To the American people, this kind of feels like deja vu all over again. Some institution is found engaging in terrible activities. There is a headline, fine, and yet no one seems to be held accountable. In September of 2017, the U.S. Department of Justice announced a revision of its policy on prosecuting white-collar crime. When corporations are the violator, the difficulty is finding the evidence to prosecute individual executives. Statements by the Deputy Attorney General indicated there will be an intensified focus on individual accountability. One of the major fraud cases of 2018 was that of Elizabeth Holmes, founder of Theranos. Ms. Holmes agreed to pay a $500,000 fine, relinquished 19 million now worthless shares of the company, and was banned from working for the company for 10 years. In September, Theranos was dissolved. In June, it was announced that she will be tried in federal court next summer and could spend 20 years in prison. A report released in March by the Prison Policy Initiative stated there were almost 2.3 million people incarcerated in the nation's jails and prisons. There is widespread understanding that our criminal justice system is overwhelmed with cases and our prisons filled with inmates whose sentences are excessively punitive and arbitrarily imposed. One in five persons in prison are there for drug-related offenses. Those in prison for these crimes are disproportionately persons of color. According to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, 2.3 million people are held in 1,719 state prisons, 109 federal prisons, 1,772 juvenile correctional facilities, 3,163 local jails, and 80 Indian country jails, as well as in military prisons, immigration detention facilities, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in the U.S. territories. No one should be surprised that blacks are overrepresented in our prisons and whites are underrepresented. The debate continues over the causes. Is it law enforcement prejudice? Is it growing up in disadvantaged communities? Is it drug dependency? Is it lack of access to high quality education? Is it the breakdown of the traditional family structure? Most likely the causes are all of the above and more. The largest prison in the United States is the Los Angeles County Jail with an annual budget of more than $700 million and an inmate population of between 17,000 and 20,000. A 2016 study by Washington University in St. Louis put the cost of incarceration in the United States at over $1 trillion. This figure includes not merely the amount spent on incarceration, but the costs absorbed by incarcerating persons families, children, and communities. The study found that for every dollar in corrections cost, incarceration generates an additional $10 in social costs. Perhaps the greatest challenge we face is one we cannot deal with without strong international cooperation, the crisis with the environment. This we will examine next.